Okay, I'll be the one person who doesn't have any slides. And all of the presentations, and Amelia at the end kind of was summarizing a lot of other presentations, all of these are based essentially, you can call them a residual based approach. So you choose a set of variables that allow you to predict the potential tax revenue. And then the residual is basically the gap between that prediction and the actual tax revenue you observe. In essence, that's what they do. They do it in different ways. And one of the things you've seen is you do it in different ways, you get different results. Um, so if you like the TRA method that Carl presented, you're saying, yeah, it looks like it's about 80% on average. Um, if you prefer the DEA approach that Dominic presented, you'll say, no, it's more like 60% on average. Um, if you look at Gregoire's estimates, you say, no, it varies a lot from country to country. And, and Amelia summarized those. And there's a number of reasons why you get this variation. The fundamental problem and challenge in this work is it's useful work because you want a broad pattern, you want some basis to compare countries. But ultimately, the residual is related to how well your model performs in estimating the potential revenue. And it's very hard to really evaluate that. So you have different arguments, well, my estimator is better or I'm choosing a better set of variables. But to illustrate the problem, I just want to give you some comments on two of the most commonly used variables to estimate these. And I've done it myself, so I'm not, this is not a criticism of any of you. It's just to highlight a profound difficulty. One variable that everybody uses is trade, some measure of trade. And and it's usually got a positive and significant coefficient. But what's that telling you? Because we know that countries have been told for decades, reduce taxes on trade. You shouldn't be taxing trade. Don't distort trade through taxation. And all countries have done that. And they've done it to a large extent. You know, up until the 1980s, low-income countries were heavily dependent on taxes on trade. But they were convinced that this protection is a disaster. It's damaging your economy, you have to reduce tariffs, and they've done it. So why is trade still significant? Because trade taxes have been dramatically reduced. So if you're including trade as a measure of tax potential, it's not because you're talking about trade taxes per se, because they've also been told to reduce them. It's because you think, well, it's a measure of economic activity. And that's what you're trying to proxy. But then you've got to ask, yeah, but who is it? Or what is it capturing? And then the other commonly used measure that people have is the share of agriculture in the economy. Why is that included? Well, it's a large argument. It's very difficult to tax agriculture. And you know, countries collect low formal taxes from the agricultural sector, from informal labor. Really, you should be talking about the informal sector or the subsistence sector. But anybody who's worked in agricultural economics and looked at broader measures of distortions to agriculture, looking at the combined effects of policy variables, pricing policy, exchange rates, trade, then what you see is, well, actually, in low-income countries, agriculture is heavily taxed, in effect. In effect, it's heavily taxed. In fact, I've often said to students, um, look, there's loads of these classifications about developed, developing, least developed. If you want to identify the point at which an economy transitions from developing to developed, it's the point at which it transitions from net tax on agriculture to net subsidy on agriculture. That's fundamental. So again, when you're including that variable, it's not working the way you want to. I'm using that to motivate 
kind of what Gregoire touched on and what Amelia was touching on is, well, how do we want to interpret effort and how do we want to use it? Whose effort? And I would make a big distinction between political effort, which is the process by which the state or the government decides how much tax revenue do we want to collect? Or how much revenue do we want to collect? Where tax is one component of the revenue. And you can have two general ways of looking at that. They've got expenditure needs, a desired level of public spending. And given that, it needs to be funded. And then they make a decision about, OK, what tax revenue do we need, given other sources of revenue, which might be aid in the old days, or increasingly it's not, um, or it might be resource rents. But there's a decision being made. And you have to understand, well, what's that political decision? Some countries want high levels of public services. They'll tolerate higher levels of tax. Other countries don't. So Korea, you identified, it often comes out as low tax effort. It's not. They're collecting the amount of tax they want to collect to deliver the level of public services they want to deliver. They're not complaining about that. It's a political decision. Similarly, and another approach could that could be you're thinking of a median voter taxpayer. You know, what, what are they willing to pay in return for whatever they're getting from the state? The other element of tax effort is the administrative effort, the admin collection efficiency. The challenge in any of the cross-country analysis is you can't really distinguish them. Um, sometimes you can try and include political or institutional variables but that's problematic. They're rarely robust. The odd time they might be significant. Corruption often turns out to be significant. But what's that telling you? Is it telling you that there's a lack of political effort? Or is it telling you, no, the nature of the politics in that country means there's a preference for low taxes? You don't quite know. You can't. And that's the difficulty with the general approach, is that you can't distinguish what is a political decision and what is administrative efficiency? Administrative efficiency is the one that we are best equipped to deal with. We've got a lot of um, increasing ammunition and toolkit for helping tax administrators to improve collection efficiency. But ultimately, they're doing that within a constraint of a political environment that makes the decisions about how much tax they want to collect and how much or what extent of tax expenditure is broadly defined, they want to tolerate. So I think the starting point of these effort measures is useful, but it has to be used then to try and say, OK, and this will be my recommendation to the World Bank, if you're going to use these to inform any discussions with the country, you should start by going to them Present them with these range of estimates and say, look, this study thinks you're 80%. This study thinks you're 25%. What do you think? Where would you want to be? Uh, what, what do you think your tax revenue to GDP ratio should be? Why? Why do you think it should be that? Is that what you think taxpayers will tolerate? Um, is that what you think um, you need to fund your spending? And once you've agreed that and started to understand what the political calculus is for deciding on their tax revenue, then you address the challenge that we're better able to comment on, which is, OK, you've decided what you want, what type of taxes you want. These are the recommendations for how you can do it better. Um, and we can make recommendations about how you should structure VAT, what you should do for any trade taxes you want to contain, um, what you need to do on income taxes, what can you do about the hard-to-tax individuals or hard-to-tax companies that is a problem in every country, <laughs> not just low-income countries. Um, and then what can you do to improve collection efficiency with administrative reforms? So I think as a starting point, it's very useful, but the best way to use it is to present the range of estimates to the the policymakers in the country and say, which do you think is right and which do you think you want and how can we get there?
Thank you, and thanks for all the presentations. Okay, we've um, come to the end of an illuminating discussion. So we'll open the floor now to questions. Yeah. Um, one question is, wouldn't it be possible to have a very simple approach? It's a very unacademic question, actually, where we look at um, a text-to-GDP ratio, look at neighboring countries, perhaps, and then we look at what countries determine, what governments determine as their medium term of revenue um, um, collection um, aspirations. I'm thinking about Ethiopia, which has a revenue collection of roughly 8% of GDP, but based on, 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 on um, recommendations by the IMF, actually, in the medium-term revenue um, strategy, they are talking about 18% of tax-to-GDP ratio. So in that case, we could say the tax effort uh, would, uh, would have a gap of 10% of GDP. And this is not totally serious. I have a, a, a couple of more serious questions. Kai, you said that uh, you found that your TRE model is better in estimating or in distinguishing between the efficiency gap and then um, and, and the, um, uh, the residual and then the efficiency gap. Uh, what makes you, th what made you think that it is uh, effectively better? That would, that would be a question to you because you didn't. Uh, elaborate on that. You just said that you found it that would be better. Dominic, I would like to know how changing variables in your model changes the scores of, uh, is, is it very sensible to changing variables? I, my, my, my assumption is that it is. And then, of course, the choice of variables that also Oliver mentioned as a key issue and also Emilia mentioned as a key issue is key. Uh, um, um, with regard to uh, Emilia, you, you mentioned the importance of governance indicators, but you also mentioned the endogeneity issue that comes with governance indicators. And um, it would be interesting to see how you approach that. And also you said that it should not matter if a country is resource rich or not. And I'm not sure about this because, you know, the literature on the resource course will always tell you, um, Dutch disease will always tell you that you have to take um, and inflows of revenues into account and, 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 uh, and in order to avoid um, Dutch disease uh, issues and to improve diversification. Okay, I think um, we can take um, one or two more questions before we give the people the opportunity to answer. Rose raised her hand first, so you may want to give her. Yeah, um, let's, let me first uh, appreciate uh, all the presenters. Very uh, uh, good uh, food, food for thoughts. Uh, my, my first issue is uh, with this uh, uh, stochastic frontier method. Uh, I like the fact that uh, I can see LICs, they seem to be having a higher efficiency a score even uh, compared to middle income countries. But the question is, uh, how do you translate that uh, efficiency to higher tax revenue? What is it that uh, we are trying to measure? So you are efficient, but your tax revenue is low. So what is it that uh, uh, we can actually uh, pull out of that efficiency uh, to ensure that LIC is uh, uh, are able to enhance their ta tax revenue. Uh, my second question uh, is related to the residential tax base. I like uh, what came out that uh, you look at uh, uh, the element VAT, all of us are paying, VAT as you are, only maybe those who are employed, and, as you, and, and you can keep on uh, going up the ladder to see the tax and uh, who is paying. But I still want to ask the same question I asked in the morning. When you are doing that, how do you determine the progressiveness of tax? That you are not necessarily overburdening uh, the same uh, residential tax base uh, by taxing them from various uh, angles. May just sort of first some of the, the, the comments by, by the discussant, um, by Oliver. Um, I mean, I think 
like firstly, the, the very good summary of where we sort of stand with these types of papers and what we can and can't do with them. And I like the sort of conclusion that they're a very good sort of entry point to this discussion, but we should probably look a bit deeper um, at what we can do. But and, and one thing you sort of picked up on, on things like, including variables like treat as a percent of GDP as a good measure of economic activity. But um, to the best of my knowledge, <clears throat> almost none of these models, including the one that we've worked on, is able to control for the sort of tax policy environment across countries and across time. So a very high trade to GDP figure in an EU country where most of that trade is not subject to customs tax doesn't really tell us much about, about the power of, of, of that for, for enhancing tax revenue. Um, and it's incredibly difficult, obviously, to bring together all of that, um, all, of the, all of the information on, on, on tax policy structures across countries and over time. Perhaps in some world, at some point in time, a very sophisticated model might try to do that, um, but we might be going further down, um, further down a rabbit hole in, in trying to do that. But that, that is one weakness that kind of exists, I, I, I think, across most of these sorts of models, and it's very pertinent. And similar to what you mentioned about not being able to control for administrative capacity. Um, again, that changes over time and across countries, but very important, especially in many low-income contexts, for the ability to actually tax a given tax base. Um, so we're, we, seem, we seem to be reasonably okay at controlling for what that tax base might look like, um, but not great at, at describing how, either from an admin or a policy side, we actually go about collecting tax from those bases. Um, <clears throat> Moving on to the two questions, um, I, think, I, think, I think Christian's question verges on being an illegal question given, um, given Abram's uh, dictation that we shouldn't ask questions about econometrics, um, but I will do my best. Um, again with the caveat that our, our absent co-author was the brains behind the Im implementation of the true random effects um, methodology. Um, what makes us think that it performs, it performs better? As my, the best way that I, I can describe it, and again, apologies for my perhaps um, simplistic understanding of, of what we've done, um, is that firstly, we did, we did that sort of exercise of understanding um, what, what tax effort scores looked like under different models um, compared to what's going into the models. And we, I, I, I only had very, a very brief sort of time to discuss that example of Slovakia, but we saw time and again where, where countries had sort of extreme values on some of the inputs, we were seeing very high or very low scores coming out of the model. And there's not, for me, there's not a more scientific way to describe that other than saying it was a bit suspect. Um, but essentially, through, through various other diagnostic tests within, within the paper, um, we, were, we were able to determine that, or we at least suspect that those other models were, were um, we're attributing a lot of what was a random error to tax um, collection inefficiency. Um, and we think that the, the true random effects model, it, it, it's better at disentangling those. It might be that it goes the other way and be, it's too extreme and actually um, uh, the scores are too conservative, as in too high. Um, but that's the sort of best explanation I can give you and, and, and apologies that I, 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 I can't go in much more depth um, than that. Um, and the second question was, I think, from, from Rose uh, saying that um, well, in, some, in many low-income countries, you see that on average they have fairly high tax um, effort scores, and how do we sort of relate that to the fact that they also collect, on average, quite low levels of tax as a percentage of GDP? Um, my sort of best, best attempt at, at, at explaining that is essentially that you have to think about what goes into the model. And so let, let's say in the model you have um, the share of agriculture and GDP, and GDP per capita, let's say there's two variables go into the model. Most of these studies have put a lot more variables in, but when you put in a fairly low GDP per capita and a highly agricultural society, you expect that, you, ex you expect given those inputs that probably your tax ratio, it won't be predicted at being very high. So when you come up with quite a good tax effort score, that means that given the economic constraints that already exist, um, and have gone in as the inputs, you're actually doing not bad at collecting tax from the whole tax base. Um, that's my sort of most, most simple way of explaining it to you. Um, thanks. I'll pass it. Thanks. So thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, on Oliver's uh, suggestion for the World Bank is actually what we do. We, we take a range of estimates and then we go deeper in the conversation and also we look tax by tax and uh, compare to aspirations. So, we have this, um, I would say, a core diagnostic that is called public finance review, and one is a tax chapter, and this is how we engage. And this tax uh, effort is just a first step to, uh, to engage with authorities. Um, 
which also uh, maybe relates a little bit to the broader question, I think, to all of us, whether, you know, uh, tax effort should not be calculated as something like a tax to GDP vis-a-vis -vis the medium-term uh, revenue strategy and uh, plans. Yes, if we think that uh, these uh, medium-term strategies actually reflect ambitions, aspirations, and, and they are... Uh, Yes, so, so that's another way to look at it. And I think all of us engaging on the tax issues for authorities are taking some of this into, into consideration. So, but they, these medium-term strategies tend to change very often, not so much as uh, they change more than, I would say, tax collection. So um, that's another word of caution. On the comment, uh, I think I was misunderstood. Maybe I think uh, it's 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 it's. I actually think that uh, one have to control for resources. So uh, I, actually, I agree with that. Uh, maybe I, I was not clear enough. Um, on um, on institutional variables, <clears throat> that's a good question. As uh, I can tell you, uh, people use different instruments to collect for, uh, to control for this endogeneity. I don't think these are very perfect ones. They are not a good one. Uh, what we do, we actually, I think most of the research that you have seen at this one of the slides do not take them into account uh, for the reasons of this causality and not a good instrument to control, to control for the endogeneity. So that's an open question to all the researchers that are here uh, to, to maybe more advance more uh, on that. Um, on the Rossi question on the progressivity of the of uh, uh, of, of the approach I presented, look, I think actually these answer a little bit your concern because uh, what this approach tries to do is to look as you have seen in these charts is that for low income earners actually what they would pay is probably a VAT. Uh, so you know the progressivity would come. We need to come uh, from the, the the VAT tax. But if you then go into the income distribution towards the end of the graph, you will see that PAT, CAT started to be on the top of it. Which means, like, if you you are a high income payer, you know you will you will you will face the uh, how much all these taxes give add to your progressivity or overall tax system. And I agree with you that one can't look into the progressivity of particular tax. And very often we don't calculate progressivity of the tax system because it's very complicated exercise. You can do progressivity of PAT or CAT, which is also already very difficult for low-income countries, but, but very, very often we don't really do uh, analysis of the progressivity or regressivity of the VAT. So sometimes we advise, make your PAT more progressive, but we don't know what happens with the VAT, so overall we don't look at the tax system. But I think the approach that at least we try to sketch is going to control a little bit for that, because it would basically be a system-wide design with the progressivity of the overall tax system, not a particular tax. But I, I think we agree on the concept that the, 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 the details are into making, so well, when we progress more, I'm happy to, to, to discuss more of that. Um, I have two points. Uh, just on trade, uh, I agree with Oliver, but uh, don't forget that uh, VIT replaces uh, tariffs in a lot of developing countries, and VIT remains mainly collected at the border. So uh, and, uh, that may explain why trade remains an explanatory variable of tax effort. And uh, yeah, uh, Ethiopia, 8 to 18. I don't know which paper do you look, but don't forget. I want, I, I resign from the IMF to be free. <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget that a lot of IMF paper, IMF uh, documents are signed by both parties. So the authorities may be not serious to improve 8 to 18. But don't forget also that I, Ethiopia is also a federal country, so maybe they are planning to re repatriate some local tax or uh, local government tax at a central level. Just. And just, uh, just finish, France managed to reduce its debt from 120% uh, of GDP to 60 in order to go in the match by delegating part of the central debt to SNCF, railway, and a lot of... Uh, <laughs> I think two things uh, I would like to comment on. So how to go from 
Uh, high efficiency to higher revenues was one question, right? And just to add to what Kale has already said, for the DA scores at least, it's trivial. It's really two sides of the same coin. So a country with a high efficiency um, has a low untap potential, right? So efficiency of one actually means zero untap potential, although that should be taken with, with a grain of salt because it's basically um, a low about estimate in terms of untap potential. Um, of course, even the country on the frontier in, in the sample, um, there will likely be some scope to improve revenues. It's just there's no other country in the limited number of countries you observe that you know, would, you know, would push the frontier. Um, so it's a conservative estimate, but it's really two sides of the same coin. Um, so for example, you have Niger, I think, um, on the frontier with very low revenue to GDP ratio, but also the weakest enabling conditions, and it's found to be efficient. Right, um, that just means that you know there's upside and downside. The countries are efficient, but that also means it's very it will be very hard for these countries to further increase revenue to GDP ratios, even if they are below 10 percent. Just you know, unless these fundamental economic conditions change, and then variable selection, of course, very important question, um, especially for this non-parametric approach because it doesn't yield any feedback on which variables should be included. Right? As you get in a regression, you get some significance levels, etc. So basically, we have to build on the insights from the literature that looks at more causal determinants. Right? Um, but on the other hand, then we don't have issues with dealing with endogeneity, assuming that the variables we use are the ones we are interested in. It's a simple descriptive measurement exercise. Um, now, in terms of robustness, yes, we do sensitivity, uh, sensitivity analysis. So what we do is, um, I mean, as always with these composite indices, you know, the weighting scheme and the way to aggregate, etc., matters. Um, so what we do is we double the weight of every individual variable going into the input index, and we drop each variable at a time. Um, and of course, the numbers change. Um, and we didn't check for individual countries. I, my guess is there will be some countries sort of with outliers that will change a lot in the ranking in terms of efficiency. But what we find very robust, even when you know, doing these exercises, is the general insight, the, you know, the aggregate picture that there are lots of low-income countries that um, are very low on achieved levels of revenues, but efficiency is actually high. So the overall sort of main results that I showed you are robust to that. Um, and I guess the re one, one reason is that the input variables we use are all highly correlated uh, to a large extent. So even dropping a single one um, does not completely lead to a, a completely different picture. Okay, um, we're kind of running out of time, so we'll take just a handful of questions. So Peter had a question, after which we'll give it to the lady. It's lunch time, Peter, so please keep it short. Okay, I'll try to be very quick, and I'll ask a very pointed question, and I'll make a, a quick comment. So um, I'm Peter Chawla from UNDESA. Kyle, it's great. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, Dominic presented some changes over time data. I wondered if you guys had looked at that and, and had any like indication that things had changed over time, and I think that would be very interesting to know, given the focus that has been on this issue for the last 10 years whether you've actually seen changes with your, with your data. And, and I like the, particularly want to ask you because I think the random effects, so I look at this data every year and to try and see where is progress happening in the world and I can see so much randomness in entering into the data every year. I mean, the policy environment doesn't change that much every year in most countries. Tax reforms are slow and yet the, the revenue data is all over the place if you, look, if you go in a specific country, right? It goes up and down by a percentage point of GDP every year. Um, so that's why I want to know when you've separated out the randomness, are you seeing some changes over time? Since I think you're, you're implying that you're separating out more randomness. Um, for Amelia, uh, two, two quick questions. One, I, I like this idea that you've got there. I wondered how you treat uh, uh, corporate taxpayers or non-individual taxpayers, and particularly, I mean, resident ones that are owned, ultimately, ultimate ownership is outside the country. How would you treat those kind of taxpayers um, in this kind of model? Because I think that's a really interesting question, which also gets to some of the things we talked about this morning in the plenary. Um, and then, 
I mean, the threshold for two porch attacks, I think, is a really interesting question. I would love to, to hear more about that. Um, because one of the points that we've made in our joint reports with the bank and others over the time is that you really need to think about uh, that even as you're attacking shadow economy, how do you attack the parts of the shadow economy that are not too poor to tax, right? Which there are large parts of, we think, in most countries. So how would you think about incorporating some of that differential between the shadow economy that's too poor to tax and the shadow economy that is not too poor to tax um, into, into your model. Thanks. And the final question from um, the lady. Thank you, Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the presentations. I think the tax effort is becoming more and more. I'm from a revenue administration perspective, and and then I think we all all interested in you know what is the tax gap and what is our effort and can we actually improve on it? So um, I really have a keen interest on this, and perhaps just then also then linking to the prior speaker. Uh, who commented on the annual volatility of tax revenues. Uh, we've seen it uh, especially before and since COVID, and when we see a financial crisis, you will find this is that, you know, there's huge differentiation in your tax collected as a percentage of GDP. And perhaps that could be because we're focusing on, on cash collections. Uh, we're not looking at tax liabilities. Um, so what we found is, is that, you know, you, you will have more variations if you look at tax collections. So where does that bring us? So if you have like a bottom-up approach rather than like a top-down approach, you will say is, is, well, this is what the economy has done this year and this is what the economy has given me. So that will be your first uh, entry point when you analyse how much revenue you've collected. And you will say, is, is, uh, were there any policy changes in that specific year and, and calculated how much will tax policy estimating to bring you in? So now you've got two legs of your total collection. So the third leg that's missing that Oliver was uh, actually telling us about is your tax administration efficiency. So now you know what the economy has given you. That is a walk-in. It's coming in. You don't do anything. Where, uh, you, you do your calculations on how much you can expect the economy is going to give you. You've calculated on how much tax policy proposals, any changes, and this is bringing you in. So the rest that you actually uh, collected will then be your uh, tax administration. So how do you measure the efficiency? And that's coming back to the lady that has asked the question. Now, if you say, well, this is how much I've collected. Um, how do I improve on that collection? So if you look at your tax administration efficiency, you've actually got four pillars to look at. Are all your registrations done? Have everybody filed that should have filed? Um, have you had your payments? If you haven't, then there will be debt. And we've seen, especially in low and middle income countries, that the debt is actually becoming a growing problem uh, for a taxpayer debt. So that impacts on that tax collections that, that is in all these models on a, on a cash basis. So how's your debt doing and how are you administering your debt? We have seen that if we put more effort into that, we can actually increase our tax effort quite considerably. And then lastly will be then your accuracy of your declarations. So that will tell you what is the attitude of your taxpayers declaring accurate declarations and your audit data will give it to thee. So from a revenue administration perspective, the best you can do is to see what you're doing with your revenue administration and, and that will then in the end determine if you take what the economy is giving you for what has happened in the economy, what policy proposals are giving you, then that is actually the telling you, well, this is your, your uh, tax effort and, and where you can actually increase that tax effort from an administration perspective. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll give the presenters one minute each, you know, just to wrap it up. And if anybody wants to point, engage them, you can, you know, meet them during lunch, I guess. Um, okay, thanks once again. Um, Firstly, firstly to Peter, um, yeah, we, so essentially we've, 
for the paper we did, we, we estimated tax effort over time for, I think it's 160 countries, and we've, um, I didn't talk about it today, but we do observe some change over time, and um, as you sort of mentioned, a, a lot less change over time than we might have seen from some other approaches, and um, we've, put those, um, we've put those scores for the whole time series on the wider website, so you can find them under the, the sort of revenue portal there, um, um, and I, th I think those... Um, as the distribution is slightly less skewed, I think also those scores do do change less over time compared to some of the other um, compared to some of the other methods. Um, so I, sorry I didn't go into it today, but like those those should be there. Um, so let me pass on. So thanks on the questions for the for the new approach. I encourage uh, uh, Gote to talk more on the corporate tax. You know, in principle, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, if you assume that that firms are owned by people, that's an easy one. But if you assume that reality is different, is so. Uh, I, I guess I I will not have more to say, and we need to develop it further. On the too poor to tax, another very hard question. Uh, but you know. Um, I think the, the way how we try to approach this is to look at the very broad and definition of income. And, and then you can maybe detect some of those that uh, don't have income but have assets, etc. But another conceptually maybe easy one, but uh, actually difficult, the one to, to, to measure. Uh, yeah, so uh, encourage work with us uh, to develop more that concept. I pass it on. No. Same for me. I was also going to donate my one minute to lunchtime. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. We thank the presenters, the discussant, and.